Hi everyone, uh, I'm Duncan McLeish and I host a horror podcast. I didn't much aware that when I started that intro, it sounded like I was at an EE meeting. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about my last six years doing a podcast from uh, a headset and a small recorder and up to a much better system than what I'm doing now. And just some of the challenges and some things that you should be aware of, specifically when you want to yourself. Uh, maybe try doing a podcast. Um, I always link it to my interest, which is horror movies. I'm kind of borderline obsessed with horror movies. I had a conversation with my colleague earlier on today where we were laughing. I'm in the process of moving house just now, and the first thing that had to be packed away was the movie collection. Um, all 700 Blu rays, ridiculously lined up, uh, in the right order as well, so it makes it easier to take them out. Uh, but yes, we're going to cover a bit of that, but some of the things that's worthwhile knowing um, if you're thinking about starting a podcast or if you have one just now and you're wondering maybe how to promote it a bit better and stuff. Um, I agreed to do this when I was drunk. Kelly, Kelly, you're watching, I know you're pretty, you are watching me, Kelly. I know you, you picked me off when I was drunk with this one, but. Um, I don't often get an opportunity to talk about my hobby. Uh, most of the time I'm in this building, it's about what I do for a living, which will not crop up, so you don't need to worry. No GIS in this one at all. So, let's swing in. Um, what did I do? So it's the podcast Under the Stairs. It's six years old on the 31st of August. I've been doing it for a wee while. Um, started it just before my daughter was born. Uh, not as a get out of looking after the kid excuse at all, that's not true. Um, as it stands just now, I think I'm about 530 episodes in. Um, it's been downloaded over 200,000 times in over 80 countries, which that's the bit that confuses me. Um, especially when things like Suriname pop up, and you're like, who's Suriname? Someone is, clearly. Um, and the website is tputzcast, because no one wants to type in the podcast. Tputzcast. So, in this show and tell today, <coughs> uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the origins of my show, uh, why I chose to do a horror podcast, what it takes to have a successful podcast, uh, set up some technology, so if you're like, I really want to start, but I don't know what to buy, we'll cover that a little bit there, uh, how social media can have an impact on your podcast, in a positive and negative, um, and then some room for some questions at the very end. But first, uh, the origins of the podcast under the stairs. I thought I'd be very bold and put a picture of a gimp up there. I don't know if you bought that straight away. That is actually from the movie, uh, The People Under the Stairs, which is where my podcast derives its name. It's a, a lesser known Wes Craven movie. Wes Craven is more notably known for Scream, uh, which she released in the 90s, which propelled him to superstar them if he hadn't already directed and written Nightmare on Elm Street, which also projected them to fame and notoriety. And then the decade before that, he released a movie called Last House on the Left, um, which was this really, really uncomfortable grindhouse movie, which gave a whole lot of notoriety there as well. So one of the few directors that managed to shape things. This is a lesser known movie. The reason I kind of picked it is one, the wordplay sounded cool. People, podcasts, some sort of thing. Just switch them out. Two, I must have seen this movie about a hundred times as a kid. This was a regular repeat offender from the, the local video store for the young ones. Videos were these cassette things. <laughs> um, so way back then when you would rent one, take them out, watch it. And I watched it like two or three times a weekend. Um, it's delivered in a edutainment fashion. In that I am not a film critic. I've never done any sort of course in film critique. Um, it's mostly me talking about the movie, what it means to me, um, trying to analyse what I think maybe the director's coming from, and try to be fun while doing it, because no one wants to listen to the driest podcast in the world. Uh, it covers old and modern horror movies. My taste is really eclectic, and there's very few kind of horror subgenres that I don't actually have, at least one or two movies that I really like. Uh, and the genres can cover everything from slasher to fan footage, from giallo to can cannibalism, and from gore to art house. So why a horror podcast? So there's a, almost a podcast for everything now. Remember when Apple used to be there's an app for that? Um, kind of the same with podcasts nowadays. Um, 
as uh, there are some niche things in there that people, you know, I've been looking at this podcast and even listening to it, but a horror in the last what, six, seven years has went through a bit of a renaissance, and specifically in terms of how much money it makes, it, it has went from being that thing that some people go and see, uh, or maybe you try and take your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, uh, and try and scare them. Try and cop a few in the cinema, if you're great. Um, but it's went to becoming a huge financial success for many studios. So much so that you probably noticed in the last couple of years anyway, it used to just be maybe October time, you get one or two horror movies. Now there's about one every month at the cinema. Big releases, big studios put them out. The reason behind them is they're cheap to make, very easy to market, and they will always make their money back. I think in the last three or four years, the only horror movies that haven't made their money back are the ones that cost a lot of money to make. They're very, 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 very financially successful. And shows like The Walking Dead, which at one point was the most watched TV show on TV, less nowadays, um, brought a whole new generation of people over watching them. I think that show boasted about 18 million viewers. Now, if you were to do an exit poll at the end of every episode and ask them, do they consider themselves a horror fan? We would say no, yet they were watching a show about people trying to survive a zombie outbreak, which is the very definition of horror. Um, so it's crossed over in the mainstream. I would like to say that I was the hipster approach to it, and I got there first. But um, to be honest, the right was on the wall. It was becoming much bigger. And my interest started to align with a lot of other people's interests, what they were doing online, that I thought it would be a good idea to do it. When someone asks me, why horror movies? Aren't they usually dumb movies where someone's screaming and running up the stairs and there's a guy with an axe chasing after them? Um, there are plenty of movies like that, but I always like to say that horror holds a mirror to society reflecting the issues. I wrote this by the way, so I'm just going to um, The issues of the time, from the fear of science, the birth of that bomb, fear of communism, reactions to Vietnam, and the current political climate. Now you might be thinking, Bullshit, okay. <laughs> uh, they don't. I've watched a few. They're terrible. Bad actors. Fake blood. No, no. Well, I've brought some, uh, brought some back up with me. Um, Frankenstein. Tragic gothic, uh, gothic horror movie. Um, my mum will continue to embarrass me by telling the story of a four year old Duncan who was watching Frankenstein on the TV and burst into tears when they killed the monster at the end. A horror fan in the way. Um, but, I mean, if you're looking beyond the surface, it's not actually hard to piece together that the way science is used in that is actually replacing God, and as a result of that, there is a fear of it. If we as humans can create life using technology, then what's the purpose of religion in God? So, lies in the back of that movie. Godzilla directly out of the wake of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the Japanese started making quite a few moves in this way about this, you know, altered beast in the, the wake of radiation poisoning, fighting down uh, armies and civilization and all the corruptions that caused its, its uh, creation in the first place. Fear of communism. Uh, America loved this for a little while. You know, there may be a communist next door, the old McCarthy era um, of America. It's quite interesting, and one that has been used uh, probably as a vehicle for a message more than any other movie is Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which has been remade like <coughs> six times by now. God knows how many iterations. There's almost one a decade. And that's the genius of the movie, is it can be done every decade, and you just change a little bit of the message. In the case of this one, is the person next door to you who they say they are, are they hiding something, are they alien, you know, and that alien could be from another world or it could be their beliefs. Um, infamous scene at the end of Donald Sullivan screaming uh, when he himself, well, it's a spoiler alert, but the movie is like almost 50 years old, uh, screams at the person because he himself has been changed into to art and getting into the future. We talked about this movie briefly earlier on. Uh, Wes Craven's like original outing after directing softcore porn uh, was The Last House on the Left. Um, and it's a, it's a, even by today's standards, it is a pretty nasty little movie. It came out in 72. Um, and it's a horrible, horrible little movie. And Craven at the time said, listen, 
When I switch on the TV at night, I can see footage of Vietnam and I can see horrible things being done to the Viet Cong and to American soldiers. What I'm showing you on the screen is no, is no harsher, it's no more uncomfortable, it's no more difficult than, than that. So why should anyone be able to watch that and you try and censor my movie? And it's continued on. If we look at two modern examples, the last two years, uh, Get Out uh, by Jordan Peele uh, won an Oscar for uh, screenplay. Um, on its surface, it's a goofy little horror movie. If you actually look at the symbolism behind it, it's a really clever horror movie. In fact, it's a bit too clever, so much so that people are slightly off put by it. It actually looks at race relations, appropriation, and how white middle class America will come for its conscious on dealing with both. There's a great line uh, where the, the white father says, listen, I, I like black people, I would have voted for Obama for a third term. As if that gives him a get out, uh, which is the name, get out, see? Um, and Assassination Nation from last year, not for everyone, if you get a chance to watch it, it's absolutely bonkers, it's like Tarantino on speed. Um, it looks at everything, the youth, millennials, social media, mob justice, Me Too movement, uh, and specifically this disenfranchisement, uh, disenfranchised millennial um, existence, how, how you can't fit into things, how you try and fit into society, and how social media like pressurises you to do everything. Which brings us on to the next part here. Uh, measuring podcast success, wholly sub subjective. What is success? Well, what do you want your podcast to achieve before you start? Um, that feels like a very kind of well, I'll just brush that back onto you, but it's true. Um, if you want to be a podcast that is the biggest podcast in the world, then there are certain things you're going to have to do in order to be ingratiated that way to get those numbers, etc. If what you want to do is um, a GIS podcast, there are some GIS podcasts out there. None of them are good. Right? None of them are good. But if what you want to do is talk people through a project you're working on. Um, popular ones, the majority of the ones I listen to are true crime investigations now. Absolutely obsessed with them. Um, and those are great. I mean, it's an investigation. It's someone digging into each episode, you find a little bit more information about it. What's your goal? Is it to uh, exonerate someone who's been wrongfully imprisoned? Is it to purely <coughs> entertain? Uh, one of the big ones in the UK is My Dad Wrote a Porno, um, which I listened to the first season and never went beyond that. Very, very, very funny. And it was literally a guy that found his father had a porno novel online under a pseudonym and he read a chapter every single episode. It's absolutely hilarious, but it's a very, very simple premise uh, and obviously became a runaway success. I think they now have an HBO TV show, which is the nuts. Um, but yeah, be realistic. What is it you're talking about? What's your audience and measure your success accordingly? Consistency is key. I get approached by a lot of people that want to start or podcasts online and say well, you've been doing it for six years how do you keep growing? I have an episode that comes out every single Monday. After this live stream here um, and chat, I will post my episode for Monday. It goes out every single Monday without fail. Um, there are so many, pod there are millions of podcasts. And that's not even an understatement. If you can't be consistent, people will go elsewhere to find another podcast and then before you know it, you've lost all the Very difficult to get them back. Be yourself and have fun. Podcasting is a career for a select few people, usually people that work for big publications or studios. And with that, you're not going to make money from it. You can make some money from it, but you're not going to make livable money from it. Um, so if you're investing your own time, your own money, you're buying the equipment, the hosting and all the rest, you better be having fun or you're now working two jobs and who wants to work two jobs when one doesn't pay? In fact, you're paying it. Does make any sense? Do your research. Try and make your show stand out. Um, when I first started, I had three horror podcast shows that I loved, and I copied all three of them. A little bit from them, a little bit from them, a little bit from them, mashed them together. Did it for a year. Got incredibly bored. Not because, uh, you know, that those shows were boring. Those shows were great, but. Uh, I felt like my voice was just a copy of someone else's voice and I very quickly changed the format, very quickly changed what I did and it's went through about three or four iterations since then and it's six years um, and where I am now, I quite like what I do, it's easy to manage, easy to post, 
it's fun. I've got a great community of people that check out my show. Um, and that shows when people listen to it, they enjoy listening to it. Feedback's always really good. And the numbers keep going up. So uh, be approachable. <laughs> um, and interactive. Um, that's a big key. Right? When you listen to a show long enough, you feel like you know that person. I'll, there are certain shows that I genuinely feel like I know the hosts. I always feel like I could go for a drink with them and get on really, really well with them. I know what their wife's names are, if we mentioned them. I know what their pet's names are, what they like, what they don't like. And a lot of that's just from just listening to the show. People want to continue that interaction, interaction beyond just listening. They'll want to come back and say, that show really inspired me. I've had people that told me that they had depression and my show helped them get through a bad day because they listened to the really funny one where I talk about the horrible movie where the guys wear obviously fake arms that fall off. Right? So these sort of things, they want to come back, taking five minutes to reply to someone's email, Facebook message, which we've got there for my phone, honestly. Um, to reply to these things makes all the world a difference. If someone feels positive, positively about what you're doing, the chances are they're going to recommend it. The more people are going to check out your show. Um, online communities, I jumped over this one, and I don't know why, because I got the word prostitute and I was getting women over that. Uh, online communities are a great way to plug your wares. So, different groups, uh, specifically on places like Facebook, you get involved with them, horror podcast groups for me, and there's tons of them out there. I join as a member, speak to the hosts, ask if it's okay for me to post my show in there. They're usually all okay, because they'll say, can we post our show in your group? Yep. So it can be a bit like prostitution, but it really does pay off. I used to do a lot of that posting on other people's pages <laughs> right at the start. Um, less so nowadays because you get to a certain stage where your show just has its momentum and it does its own thing. Uh, and finally, know that there's actually an audience. That feels like something that everyone should be really acutely aware of when starting anything. It's the same in technology. If you're building an app or you're building a product, know someone wants to buy it. Podcasts are exactly the same. My podcast only gets downloaded five times a year. Why does it only get downloaded five times a year? Well, it's talking about Swiss postal systems from 1843. Right, there's going to be a niche. I could have told you at the start, there's going to be a niche listener base for that. So, yeah, as it comes back to that measuring success thing of know who your audience is, do a bit of investigation, make yourself stand out, be interactive and approachable, and if you can do that, people will gravitate towards it. Which gets us to the techie bit, the bit that you've all been waiting for because you're all techie people. Um, what do you need to do a podcast? Uh, back in the day, it was very convoluted and it cost you a lot of money, but technology is now super cheap. I know people that podcast on their phones, they record a wee voice memo, they can edit it in GarageBand on their phone, and then they can upload it, and it's as simple as that. Not the most inspiring podcast you listen to, but it can be done. Um, so what do you need? A minimum requirement, a device to record audio, that sounds fairly self-explanatory, a good microphone. I will turn off a podcast within a minute if the microphone sounds bad. <laughs> we'll do it, because, like... You want me to listen to you do something, so I need to be able to hear you. If it's all crackly and distorted and all the rest of it, nope, fine. Uh, editing software. You may be moving out of the, the realms of kind of beginner stuff into more intermediate, but editing software is a good shout. Um, a host, server, or website which allows you to create an RSS feed. That will become important in a minute. So you need to host a podcast. Minim uh, medium requirements are a designated horror po podcasting host service. There are loads out there. There used to be like maybe one or two, but lots of them get into the market. Uh, Libsyn's a big one. SoundCloud's a huge one. It's the one that I currently use. Podbean is developed purely for podcasts, whereas SoundCloud's for musicians and creative people. Um, and that is Buzzsprout. That's a fairly new player, but they're kind of piggybacking on the, the Podbean sort of side of things. All of these allow you to generate an RSS feed, which in turn will allow you to plug into lots of podcasting devices. Uh, Spotify have recently made the transition in there now. When they first started, it was very, very difficult. They only wanted certain podcasts on their, on their pages from big paid companies. Uh, nowadays, not so much. They have a premium service where certain uh, larger organizations will pay for specific content. But 
you can just drop your RSS feed into Spotify and then listeners can find it from there. Same with Stitcher, Smart Radio, Acast, TuneIn, iTunes and iHeartRadio. So that's all fine, but what does that setup actually look like? Well, it looks a little bit like this. So here's me. Hello. Um, my setup is myself. Um, I've got a Blue Yeti microphone. I love it. It's my baby. Um, but it's blue and really kind of corner of the market for podcast and mics. Um, they're really, really, really good. They're very adaptable, very easy to use. Plug in the max. Um, I use GarageBand to record all my audios. Everything goes into GarageBand. Now, I have quite a lot of international guests that join me, occasionally a director or someone from a publication. Um, I will use uh, Google Hangouts and split the audio into a separate track, um, which is a bit techy. But it's fair that you can buy software that will do that for you. Um, this is a phenomenally powerful bit of kit and it's open source and free. It's called Audacity. And Audacity basically allows you to record any audio from any instrument and then have a huge raft of um, kind of post processing um, gates, uh, compressors, uh, normalization. Uh, noise removal, which is a great one. Um, so if you're recording in a place where you know there's some ambient noise of like maybe an air conditioning fan or, or whatnot, if you record a little bit of just that that frequency, you can then say find that frequency and remove it from the recording. It does it for you. Uh, it's free. So um, my output from Audacity goes to SoundCloud. I connect it to my website, and then it goes to all these places. You can check out what I do. Which brings me on to a big one here. Um, I've yet to find any sort of artistic endeavour or output that doesn't come across kind of social, social media hunger games. Because that's basically what it is nowadays. Um, there is a lot of them out there. Podcasting, because it is not a visual form, it's an audio form, um, it's, it makes some of these social networking a bit, um, a bit like trying to put like a drawing pin in with a sledgehammer. So there are the big four, um, and that's not the big four as in a few things. Um, so where to, where, where to start and what do you absolutely need to have? Um, and what's the benefit of them? So I've got a couple of icons along the bottom here. Let's discuss them. Facebook, everyone's favourite. Um, Facebook uh, has ruled the rest, and it has, it really has for quite some time now. Um, and groups and pages come with their own pros and cons. Big pro, free to set up. Just jump on there, if you've got a Facebook account, just set up, boom, that's it done. And you can easily moderate them. Now, when your group gets beyond a certain size, that easily moderate bit gets difficult. But you can then assign moderators. You can pick up two or three of your friends and say, right, I want you to monitor these things. You lose a bit of control when you do that, but it's easy to set up. Um, closed groups. So I have two. I have a Facebook page and a Facebook group. Um, one of them is public facing. The closed group is not public facing. The reason behind that is because I'm a horror podcast, people will post things which some people may find offensive. So I keep that closed so only people in the group see that. Um, also allows you greater vetting. You can set up a few questions that can be asked to anyone joining your page. It's an automation thing, you know, what, what sort of shows do you listen to, what's your top three horror movies, and all these things, you get the answers through it. And if someone's writing that their top three horror movies are Independence Day, um, Step Up to the Streets, and I don't know, Bambi, well maybe Bambi, I'll get Bambi scam, so maybe let them off with that. Uh, but you can do a little bit of vetting there, gives you a bit of control. But it's also the biggest social media platform in the world, so if you want to get your name out there, that would make sense. It does come with cons, though. Um, algorithms. The beam of my existence. Someone posts something really interesting, or I post something and say, check this out, guys. Um, if you are someone who generally doesn't look at my posts, you're not going to see that. Facebook's going to say, doesn't want to see, and that pins it. So it doesn't give a clear indication of what timelines actually look like. Facebook jail is a real thing. I've got a really funny meme. I'm going to post it. Someone takes offence to it. Boom, you're in the sin bin for five days. It's a real thing. 
Um, it's the biggest con is it's the biggest social media platform in the world. It's not really designed to make any one user happy or any one small group happy. It's designed to really suit its investors, and as a result of that, you're a small, small, small penny in a giant pond. Twitter uh, is great for a podcaster. It really, really is because you can do a very short, quick, dummy message about your podcast. Sling it out there, a couple of hashtags on the, on the back of it, someone comes across it, very easy to repost, retweet, all the rest. It does come with pros and cons. Pros, free setup. Again, I mean, that's a no brainer. Uh, no need to maintain a group, just subscribers, also really, really cool. It's the 12th biggest social media platform in the world, which surprised me. I would have put it in top five, but apparently, quite a few above it. For some reason, Tumblr is still in the top 10. So I'm going to need to explain that to you. Um, cons, same thing, algorithms. What do you like to see on Twitter? Well, he doesn't usually read posts like that. He doesn't need to see it. Twitter jail is a real thing as well. Um, I'm going to I'm going to say something bad about the American president. Twitter jail. Boom, you're banned off the site. Um, and character limit is a real pain, especially if you want to get creative with your hashtags, uh, which I like to do. Um, you have that one. Instagram, Instagram and Instagram TV, which is their offshoot. Uh, it's quick and easy to maintain. You can post show art links as well as vlogs for trailers. So I, for a while, they would create small snippets of funny excerpts from my shows and put them up there. So they're available. Um, free setup. Uh, no need to maintain groups, just subscribers, very much like Twitter. It's the sixth biggest social media platform in the world. Cons. Algorithms again. Algorithms everywhere I look. Uh, Instagram jail is also a real thing. Remember, Instagram is owned by Facebook, so it's worth keeping that in the back of your head. And is it the best tool for a medium which isn't visually based? Probably not. No one really wants to know what my face looks like, they just want to hear what I say. So, you to keep that in the back of your head. Which brings me to what I'm actually super excited about. Um, flick. So um, they are like the new kid on the block right now, and they're developed specifically for podcasters. Uh, they're based in Codebase Edinburgh, shout out to Codebase Edinburgh. Um, but yeah, so they are a, a kind of startup company who launched their app a couple of months ago. And um, as you can see, I put more on the pros here than the cons because I've been using it for about a month, and I'm struggling to find things I dislike about it. Um, it's really set up. Uh, and can be easily monitored and uh, moderated. You can set yourself up as an admin and as many people as you want as moderators. Uh, there's no algorithms. It's a message board system, which I love, and you can um, set yourself up in, in a position where if there's 10 message boards in that group, and I'm only interested about the one that talks about the movie I really like, I can silence everything else and only get notifications from that one. Um, it links directly to your RSS feed in the app. So my podcast can be listened to directly in Flick and people can post it in the message chats, which I create for my episodes while they're listening, which is something which seems so simple, but it's all done in one app. And that to me is a huge selling point. Um, it's all a real platform that is just now actually designed from a social media point of view for podcasters and listeners. The only one. So as a result of that, it doesn't have any of the trappings that all the other ones have which are designed for everything else. It's purely for podcasters to post the links to their shows or discussion topics, listeners to interact with them. Couldn't be any more simple than that. The biggest con is it's still in its infancy at the moment. Its user base is kind of currently limited, but having used it, I, I, I get a feeling it's going to take off pretty quick. Um, and when it does, I, I, I probably look to start migrating most of my traffic through that, just because it's better. So what one should you actually use? Well, the answer at the moment is all of them, because like I said, the pro column for each single one is free. Every single one's free. Granted, it is an absolute pain to maintain four different apps, uh, which have four different purposes, and use four different methods of promoting your podcast, but at the same time, anything that gets the word out is you know, beneficial to you. Any, any way you can get people interested in what you do, you should be doing it. So, yeah, I use all four. Any time, I'm hoping 
Facebook goes away, um, and maybe even Twitter goes away, and I would love to keep just Instagram and and Flick. I was going to put something in about GIS, and I spent a good two hours last night crafting data, modelling it, putting it on a map and all the rest, and I realised very, very, very quickly that one, it would take me five minutes to explain to anyone who doesn't work in GIS uh, what it was that you were seeing on the screen, and the clip that would play would run for about 15 to 20 seconds. Not much of a payoff there, a bit dry. So um, instead I've decided that we'll bask in my glory. Uh, we'll do that by looking at like growth on the podcast. Um, 2016, about 33,000, so you take the plays and downloads. Um, almost doubles for 2017, um, and then, you know, build up another huge amount in 2018. And that's for all the reasons I mentioned before. Always make sure you've got an episode out on the day you say you've got an episode out. Be very approachable and interactive on social media. And find what your user base is. I will occasionally put out a show which covers a really popular horror movie because I know that's going to spike really well. Um, I might pick the new It movie that comes out. I might be like, It Chapter 2, review coming out. And like, yeah, they're trending for it. They're download it. On the back of that, I will then do a show on lizard in a woman's skin, which is this really obscure Italian movie, kind of psychosexual thriller, murder movie, which uh, like only niche people are going to be interested in. But I'm going to place my bet that if you listen to me talk about that movie, you might want to listen to me talk about another movie. And as a result, I'll weigh it off. And you can see it goes in peaks and troughs. Sometimes it's a lot, sometimes not a lot. Uh, but consistency is the key. That's why the numbers keep going up. Um, what, what I didn't show you is what the numbers were like when I started. I think my first year I had like about 300 downloads for a whole year. So I'm doing, what am I doing? I could have been spending that time with my back to the door. Um, which brings me to the very end. Uh, I want to thank you all very much for your time. Uh, suffering through a subject you might not necessarily be interested about, but hopefully I've given you some food for thought, and um, you can check out my show on any of these links down below, um, or drop me a line if you're thinking about starting a podcast, or you have any specific questions on what you, you need to start a podcast, or any other advice or trappings, um, let me know. But are, are there any questions just now? Ah, I'm back. <laughs> um, if it's just me, um, so a good example is I recorded one episode uh, yesterday, it was talking about one movie, um, the episode length was about half an hour long, the actual audio recording is not half an hour because I've got bumpers and promos and all the rest after it's through my show, so the recording was maybe about 20 minutes, about 10 minutes to edit, then the kind of post-process and render down all the rest, maybe about 15 minutes, update the website, five minutes, it's all done within well, just, just about an hour, just over an hour. The episode that drops today has three guests in three different time zones, one America, one Australia, one UK. Um, the episode is about three and a half hours long. Yep, it's into the long haul. Um, and it took three and a half hours to record. It took about an hour and a half to edit down. Um, all in all, probably about half a day to, to, to get that one to the finish one. Um, so yeah, it's I do very little editing now because at the beginning I was very conscious of my voice. I hate listening to myself, really, really do. Um, especially when it comes to like, like that. Um, I used to take out M's. It's been really bad for that at the beginning. M, M, cut, 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 cut. Um, audacity also has the ability to remove noise, well, lack of noise. So it cuts out breaks, so if I lost my notes, or checking on the internet for my next bit of notes, I might have a pause of about five seconds. You can set up to make sure that all the pauses are about two seconds. And I'll run through and do that for you. What I found very, very quickly after doing it for about two years is that no one cares at all. No one cares. Um, on top of that, not only does no one care, it doesn't sound natural. No one speaks constantly all the time, it doesn't take a break, and you're like, it doesn't sound natural. 
So I stopped doing that. Uh, and as a result of that, people have come back. They really enjoy the fact that sometimes I laugh at my own jokes, uh, which are not funny at all. Maybe I should have cut that out there, but they come back and say, you laughing at that horrible, the not funny joke was funnier than the not funny joke. So you get into the habit. I think trust your instincts. I think everyone is their own worst critic. And um, listener feedback is really good for that. Uh, just try and experiment, change the way you do things and gauge the reaction of your listeners. And it, it, it does go a long, long way. It's taken me, it took me three years to find a sin that I liked. And as soon as I found that, as soon as I found an audience for it, I haven't really changed since. It's not Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you said you've been doing this for six years, yeah? Yes. At what point did you find that you wanted to reach out and help other people join you in the podcast and did you find that was like an instant success or do you reckon that was a bit of time to sort of up? So I did it straight away. So when I started my show it was me and a friend from Glasgow who used to get very 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 drunk and just chat about horror movies and we were like you know what people would love to hear these conversations. <laughs> people would love to not be didn't at the beginning, but I was already a member of two or three different groups. I said that there's three podcasts that I specifically love to listen to. What I did back then was I I, I reached out to them. I got one of the hosts from my favourite show to come on and chat directly on the show. We reviewed the original Child's Play movie way back in the day. And then... Um, I, there was a cynical reason for that. One, I was kind of friends with the person, but two, they had a much bigger listener base. And I was like, my first show was out, they posted it on their page. Didn't work, didn't work. Like I say, that first year, very few people checked it out. Um, but I've always, always had guests on. Uh, so only in the last year or so, I've started doing more myself. And that was a confidence thing more than anything. I've always felt that I've been really well off other people. Someone will say something, and I've got actually funny, I'll, I'll come back on that. I also really like interviewing people as well, so I like that idea of not me just speaking to the boy. Um, but over time, I found that it's actually you. You once you become too self-conscious when you remove yourself from that, it's very easy just to record yourself uh, and then just edit it down yourself. So I still I still have guests from time to time. My shows went from being almost ninety percent guest driven to now I would say twenty five percent guest driven, seventy five percent myself. Any other questions? Yep. You were talking about the RSS feed. Yep. With the SoundCloud and stuff. Yep. And you said you connect that to Spotify. Yes, so... Is there any charts? No. Nope. Okay. You've got to remember, you're, you're doing all the work. Spotify, all Spotify is getting from that is people are using their application to listen to your thing. Yeah. So, it's, like, it's the same with iTunes. People for a while were like, why are iTunes not investing any money in their podcast app? Because they don't make any money from their podcast app. You know what I mean? It's a free app to download. Um, but what it does do is drive a market share of people to own Apple products to listen to their podcasts. So it's the same with Spotify. Spotify, it, they've all moved into that recently. Um, but it's it's purely cynical reasons. They want people using Spotify for music and podcasts and audiobooks and all the rest. Why not? It's, it, it's, it makes sense for them. You're doing all the work. You're paying for the software. You're recording the content. You're uploading it. You're doing all that work, and you're putting it. If you breach their guidelines, they will remove you. And that's as simple as that. Just doesn't mean anything to do it either. Okay. Good one is uh, don't know how many people are aware of Alex Jones. No. Alex Jones is this really eccentric American guy who deals in conspiracy. He has a website called Infowars. Don't go on it. Um, but he's nuts. Absolute nuts. You know, he did a big, big rants about how uh, the American government is polluting the water to turn the frogs gay. That's an actual thing to check out on YouTube. Um, but he has you know, lots of hateful kind of diatribes and he got to a certain point where Facebook blocked him and as soon as Facebook blocked him, Twitter blocked him. Actions removed his podcast. Spotify won't play his podcast and all the rest. Um, and they can do that. And when someone complains back, these are products and companies. At the end of the day, you are using their service, so they have the right to do what they want. But it's incumbent on them. If people don't submit their RSS feed, they have no podcast platform. So it's all built off the back of that, so they're in charge. So super easy to do, and I would say get it on every single platform. Every platform you can, because even if only one person listens to it through Stitcher, that is one person that listens to it through Stitcher. So in time, 
more people will find it or so and so will say, oh, I found it here on this app or you find it that way. These things go through peaks and troughs as well. Spotify's huge at the, uh, at the moment. I don't know in two years time if Spotify is going to be the leader. If another tech app is going to come up that's going to amalgamate a lot of those services and just do it better. It's why that Flick app for me is so cool um, because you get to do the interaction with the podcaster plus you can plug the RSS feed directly into it. So it's almost like a spot of five comments, which I think is just like so much better. Um, and it makes me wonder how we have gone so far into the podcast life cycle. That's only someone just figuring out how to do that. I don't, I don't think it's easy to do, but yeah, put on a bit. You've got nothing to lose. No one listens to it on iHeartRadio. No one listens to iHeartRadio. It takes two seconds to set up your account. That's it. Any other questions? Yes. I <laughs> I have a very lazy, fair approach to things. Uh, my colleagues will tell you that extends into the professional life as well as the personal life. I, I, I have a really good memory, like a ridiculous memory for detail. When I watch something, I'm already breaking apart. I'm taking the key things out that I want to mention about something. I never sit down with a page of notes. I have record and know plenty of podcasters that have meticulous notes written out. One of my co-hosts that comes on kind of ad hoc will spend, he watched the movie twice, one to take his notes and then second to see if he actually liked it or not, which is a very kind of harsh from elbow way of approaching things. Um, I don't do much in the way of, I don't even know where my conversation is going to go when I sit down. I just chat. I think in a lot of respects, if it was too formalised for me, I wouldn't enjoy doing it. I would be also very critical of, I can't believe I missed it, that really big important point that I wrote and underlined and highlighted three times in five different colours. Um, to me, the conversation just goes to where I'm interested in. Uh, but I know plenty of people, and both approaches are meritful as long as you tell your listeners up front. It's why I go with that edutainment bracket as opposed to just education. Because if I've wrote a, an essay on something, it's social effect, it's all that. If I'm doing like almost a documentary style of a, approaching something, a thesis approach to it, then I'm going to want to make sure that people know up front that it's going to go in detail. Whereas there's some movies that are just out just now, at chapter two, when I do my review on that, I will not spoil that movie at all because I will be lynched um, from the podcast hall. Literally, people will be like, spoilers, man, that movie's just out. So... You need to you need to wait up. So what suits your own way as well? I'm not that way inclined. To me, sitting down and writing something is boring, so I'll just speak um, and, and see where it goes. That sometimes means that I realise that I've said the same point twice during the recording, and I pick it out of my edit and work it in my head. That sounds silly. Also, sometimes people will come back and say, I can't believe you said that, you know, uh, Halloween came out in 1979, when we all know it was 1977. Uh, and I have to acknowledge that, that I will make mistakes when I, but you're not, you shouldn't be listening to me as the be all and end all of horror, because I'm not, I, I don't have anything in the background of that, but uh, hopefully when you listen to it, you can really laugh, and you take something away from it, even if it is, maybe I should check out that Assassination Nation, the Duncan mentioned earlier on, has been like Tarantino on speed, um, Tarantino on speed, not speed. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that's the one thing, it's just what fits yourself. First and foremost, try and make sure your personality gets through and you're recording. Um, otherwise, you're being someone else to do something else. So, I swear a lot in my regard, but I'm not safe for work and for my podcast because I swear a lot. My colleagues will tell you I swear moderately in office. Yeah, I swear a lot. Anyone else got any more questions? Yep. I don't. Is that you sponsored or is that something you're interested in? So, interestingly enough, that conversation comes up from time to time. Uh, there's a site, you may have come across Patreon before. Uh, so, Patreon is a website which is exactly what it says it is, it allows you to become a patron of the arts. And originally it was used by artists and musicians, so I'm a small indie band, I really want to record my next EP, where I make no money from the label. You invest in, you pay a set tier bracket like Kickstarter, and what we'll do is we'll ship you off the first copy of the album, we might give you first 
at length of the tour, etc., etc. Podcasters started jumping on and using this about four or five years ago, um, and I was very wary of it then. I'm still very wary of it now. Uh, what they do is they'll give additional content, they'll give you a shout out at the end of the show, they might let, if it's a movie review, they might let you pick a movie, they might send you the copy of the movie that they've watched as perks and tears. And I have a lot of friends that swear by it, that's what they do. Uh, for me, it was a hobby, I just like sat down, it doesn't cost a lot, a sim cloud for unlimited bandwidth costs about £75 a year. The cost of a website is about, what, 20, 30 pounds a year. If you're going with, I use Squarespace for mine, so it's a template, I do very little with it, except most of my shows. Um, and once you've bought your gear, that's you. It, the cost of running it after that is, I already own the movies, or I own something that I can stream the movies on. That being said, um, I would be lying if I hadn't thought when I reached a certain download bracket, you know, if every person that listened to this episode chucked in a pound a month, I could probably give up the what I'm doing here. <laughs> like, and go away and do that full time. But I don't know the practicalities of that, how, how that works. What I do is every year I pay a friend who does the majority of the artwork. You see that one in the background. I pay him a hundred quid or something. He designs a poster. I put that poster design on a poster or on a t-shirt run a merch campaign, you can now do merch campaigns which will only print the amount of t-shirts bought and the size and the stick or they'll do that for you. So you spend it and they give you a cut of the money and that cut of the money has paid the cost of my SoundCloud and it's paid the cost of my website hosting for the last four years. So I'm not out of pocket but I don't make anything like that. Flick um, have just recently started a a version of Patreon built into their app, which I think is quite interesting. But they went the other way around. They went for you can't pay to get exclusive content, or you can pay to support the show. So, and the way they've kind of pivoted it, and I think it's really quite an interesting way is uh, like the minimum donation is roughly the cost of a cost of coffee. Uh, so, like that. So, instead of buying a coffee this month for as many coffees, give that money to the podcaster who you're listening to while you're drinking coffee. And I'm not saying I'll never, never do it, but at the moment, just, I, I don't know, I'd still get a bit skeeved that people are listening to me in weird countries, you know what I mean? <laughs> why do I have listeners in Japan? I don't know why they're listening to me. So part of me feels a bit cheeky about saying, right, pay me now. Plus, there are so many podcasts out there that are free, unless you've already got that buy in there, you're now putting a paywall restriction. You're not necessarily, with Patreon, the show still gets released. It's just some people can help pay the way. But I, I, I haven't found a methodology yet that I'm it has a comfortable with. Yeah? Hmm? I don't. I advertise other shows, so other shows send me the promos that I play with my show if I like my show. Uh, if I don't like the show, I don't pay it. Because that's my thing. If I'm saying go and listen to that, we like doing product placement. Uh, I'm very much of a, I'll only tell someone to check out a movie that I like, or skip play a movie I dislike, or check out a show that I like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, folks.